This podcast is part of the Dark Myths Collective. Visit darkmyths.org to discover more shows like this one. The darkness awaits. History tells the story of the world and of our lives. Sometimes that history goes bump in the night. Broadcasting from the center of oddity and the supernatural in central Florida, it's the History Goes Bump podcast. Hello, you spectacular people. Welcome to this 286 episode of the History Ghost Bump podcast, Ghost Tours for the Theater of the Mind. I am your host, Diane. On this episode, we're going over to a location over in Scotland that was suggested by listener Brian Morse, and this is the Culloden Battlefield. This may be familiar to quite a few listeners if you are fans of the Outlander series, both the written one and the TV series. Now, I haven't watched any of it, so I don't know that much about it. It's one of those things I have on my list to get to someday when I actually have some free time. But in the Outlander series, this is about a World War II nurse named Claire. She walks through one of these things that I call like a megalith a place where ley lines go through. And this is in Scotland. And she goes back in time when she walks through this area from 1946 to 1743. So most of the novel and the TV series is set in Scotland, specifically in the Highlands. And one of the settings in both the book and the TV series is Culloden. Because the Outlander made it so popular, it's a place that a lot of people have started flocking to to visit. But what took place on this battlefield in reality would forever change the clan way of life in Scotland, and not in a good way. Because of all that negative energy that happened, not only because of the battle, but I think because of the results of the battle, we have some haunting activity going on here. I'm looking forward to sharing that with you. Before we get into that, we want to welcome into the Spooktacular crew, Caleb, Sean with an E-A-N, Tim, Crystal with a K, and Laura. Welcome, everybody. And now, this moment, Naughty. The moment Naughty was suggested by John Michaels. There was a time in the mid-19th century when the Lond region in southwestern France was a swampy terrain. Raising sheep and keeping a homestead was very difficult in this area. The people who lived here were poor shepherds, and they knew they needed to come up with a way to make their lives easier. That's when they came up with the idea of making stilts and using them to traverse the landscape. The stilts were called changs, which meant big legs. They were made from wood and stood five feet high, had wide straps to support the feet, and the bottoms were widened and solidified with sheep's bone. The shepherds used the stilts to take wide strides, and it gave them the opportunity to see their flocks from a high perch. Some used staffs to give themselves more support. And the shepherds became so comfortable on the stilts that they spent most of their lives on them. This skill also transferred to the other townspeople and included the women and children. All the people became very adept and could perform amazing feats of balance and dexterity. Children walked the school on stilts and did their chores on them as well. Women could pluck flowers from the ground. Eventually, they were performing feats for visitors to the region, which included Empress Josephine, who stopped here in 1808 to meet Napoleon. The stilt walkers greeted her and managed to keep up with her carriage horses. By the end of the 19th century, the marshland was drained and replaced by a plantation of pine trees, and a forest is there to this day. But there was once a time when living on stilts saved a French community, and that certainly is odd. This history podcast is haunted. And now, this month in history. In the 
the month of December on the 20th in 1606, the Virginia Company expedition to America began with three small ships. These ships were called the Susan Constant, Godspeed, and Discovery. Captain Christopher Newport led the expedition as it launched from London with 105 men and boys and 39 crew members. The ships landed in Puerto Rico on April 6th and they collected provisions. They arrived at the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay in late April, early May of 1607. Chaplain Robert Hunt offered a prayer as a cross was set up at the landing site. The expedition would move further inward. They ventured up the James River and found a suitable spot to establish the first permanent English settlement in America. They called it Jamestown after King James I. The battlefield of Culloden is under the care of the National Trust for Scotland and can be found in the Scottish village of Culloden. Culloden Village is an ancient town with buildings dating back to the 1600s, one of which is Culloden House that is today a hotel. The battlefield was the scene of the Battle of Culloden that would be the final confrontation of the Jacobite Rising of 1745. This battle was bloody and casualties were high. This has led to paranormal activity on the battlefield that seems to recreate the battle. Along with this are stories of omens, premonitions, and the scree. Join me as I share the history of the Battle of Culloden and the resulting hauntings of the battlefield. Culloden Village is found in the Scottish Highlands, and the name is Gaelic, meaning back of the small pond. Historic buildings that are found here include Culloden House, the Culloden Stables, and the Barn Church. This village would become the scene of the final battle in the Jacobite Uprising and the resounding defeat of those same Jacobites. It would do more than just stop an uprising. This defeat would make it illegal to play bagpipes or to wear tartan and the clan way of life and system were destroyed. Jacobites were Scottish clans that supported the reinstatement of King James II. He had been deposed by English nobility, and they had replaced him with William and Mary. At the time, James II had been king over both England and Scotland, and he had converted to Catholicism. The English nobility said, it's not okay for him to be Catholic, so we're going to depose him. The Scots, on the other hand, would recognize nobody but James as their king. So when William and Mary were put in place, they said, oh no, they're not our rulers. We don't want them. So we're going to have a lot of uprisings with this group of Jacobites. It's going to happen throughout the 1700s. The Jacobite rising that we're going to talk about on this episode is the one that began in 1745. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, it is the last one. This is going to be their final push to get the House of Stuart put back in place. This Jacobite rising that began in 1745 was also called the 45 Rebellion. And what this was is you had Charles Edward Stuart, and he wanted to regain the British throne for his father, who was James Francis Edward Stuart. My understanding that what we have happening here is there were different houses of families that would rule at different periods in the United Kingdom. After William and Mary were off the throne, Queen Anne took the throne, and she was there until she died in 1714. Now, unfortunately, when she died, none of the children that she'd had were alive, so there was nobody for her to hand down the crown to. So there was this thing called the Act of Settlement of 1701, and this gave the throne to her cousin, George I. Well, George was not a part of the House of Stuart, so when this was handed over to him, the rule passed from the House of Stuart to the House of Hanover. And some of you may not recognize the name Charles Edward Stuart, but perhaps you would recognize the name Bonnie Prince Charlie. I know that I had heard that before, so I'm sure many of you have too. That's who Charles Edward Stuart is, is Bonnie Prince Charlie. So he decides he wants to get his dad back in place, which mainly is trying to get the House of Stuart back in as kingship or queenship, however you want to look at it. 
So he's going to launch this rebellion on August 19th in 1745. The initial battle in this uprising was at Glenfinnan, and the result was the capture of Edinburgh. Some of the Scots were unsure of continuing to push back against the British. They had this success, but some of them weren't sure they really wanted to go into actual England. Some of them were like, "Mm, maybe this is good enough. Do we really want to push back? Charles comes to them and he says, look, guys, I, I know you're not really sure about pushing further in and continuing the fight, but I guarantee to you that there's a bunch of English Jacobites that are going to come to our rescue. They're going to join us and we're going to have a huge force and we're going to do great. Well, Bonnie Prince Charlie was probably what you would consider to be a good politician these days. And what makes somebody a good politician? Well, it seems lying. Now, maybe he thought that the English Jacobites would show up, but they didn't. They weren't going to get any help. But the group, they believe him. So they go ahead and they enter England. And they do this in early November and they push all the way to Derby. And they get there by December. But the people there are starting to realize uh, the English support is not showing up here. It never materializes. And so we're going to start seeing a split between the Scots and Charles. And this is all happening before we get to the Battle of Culloden. That battle takes place in April of 1746. The location is going to be on the southeast side of Inverness. This is a few miles southwest of Nairn, and the date was April 16th. This would be a matchup between the Jacobite army of Prince Charles and the royal troops of King George II, which were under the command of the Duke of Cumberland. The armies were fairly equally matched, with 7,000 in the Jacobite army and 8,000 in the royal army. The regiments present at the battle were Cobham's 10th and Kerr's 11th Dragoons, Kingston's Light Dragoons, the Royals' 1st, Howard's Old Buffs the 3rd, the 4th Regiment of Barrels' King's Own, Wolfe's 8th, Pulteney's 13th, Price's 14th, Bly's 20th, Campbell's Royal Scots Fusiliers, the 21st, Semple's 25th, Blakeney's 27th, Chamondelay's 34th, Fleming's 36th, Monroe's 37th, Lingonier's 48th, and Batteroo's Foot the 62nd. Now on the Jacobite side, many people probably would think that these were mostly Gaelic-speaking Catholic Highlanders, but in reality, many of these men were non-juring Episcopalians, and they were from the Lowlands. There were also English, French, and Irishmen among their numbers. So we have these two armies meeting each other. But keep in mind, as I described earlier, we have a split going on with Prince Charlie's men. This is something you do not want to have happen before you're about to engage in a big battle. Now, the reason why we have this split is not just because these men are thinking, hey, you said all these English Jacobites were going to come help us and they didn't show up. We also were having issues with deciding what kind of warfare are we going to engage in. Many of us in America know the difference between different fighting styles that you would have when it came to the Revolutionary War. You have the British Redcoats who are very regimented. They've got their weapons and their little redcoats and they form lines and they only fire when they're told to. And it's a really stupid way to fight as far as I can see. Whereas the colonists were fighting as if they were ambushing and they were following the tactics of the Native Americans and they were a lot more successful with the kind of tactics that they were engaging in. Well, it was the same thing over here for the Scottish clan people. They were used to doing guerrilla warfare. They would go into these villages and raid them, surprise attacks and that kind of thing. They were completely unexperienced with professional military strikes. And I don't think they were probably really interested in conducting them because, again, it's not really a smart way to fight, at least not back then. Nowadays, with the kind of technology that we have, professional military strikes seem to work really well. But back here, especially redcoats wearing those redcoats, it's like, here, here's a target on my back. So what you have here is the Scottish clansmen are going, Bonnie Prince Charlie, we know you're of the royal family and you've got all this military training in your head that's very regimented, but that's not our way. We don't want to fight that way. And so you've got this inner battle going on about how are we going to do this? On top of that, you have a split within the ranks. 
the officers of the infantry were from upper classes and the aristocracy. And then you've got foot soldiers who were basically poor agricultural workers. I think we could see where we're going to have an issue here. So you've got the quote unquote officers who are the rich guys and from the royal families and they really don't have to engage here. They can run. They're sending the little lowland poor guys out there to get hammered is basically what we're going to have happen here. And this really makes me think of Braveheart, watching a lot of the battle scenes in that movie. That's what you were seeing a lot of, is these men who were just farmers, basically, that were being sent out to, on the field, you're going to go hand-to-hand battle while the royalty kind of hung off on the hillside and watched everything happen. So you've got these tensions going on as well. You've got some major issues that happened during the decision-making about what tactics they were going to go forward with, and this is going to weaken the Jacobites further. Lord George Murray led a heated council with the officers as he pushed for guerrilla warfare, and he believed there was not time to launch an attack and that they should just abort. So he's like, I think if we're going to go forward, we should do it with guerrilla tactics, but look, we don't have time to do that now, so let's just forget it. Let's just go home. He goes to Prince Charlie's right-hand man, who was named Sullivan, and he tells him, look, go tell the prince we don't have time. We're just, we're not going to do this. And we're not going to do it the way that he wants to do it. We're going to abort. Well, unfortunately, this is taking place at night. And somehow O'Sullivan misses Prince Charlie in the darkness. He does not get the message to him. So you've got George Murray taking his men, which was about one third of the Jacobite forces, back to camp. They're aborting this whole mission. The other two thirds of the force have no idea that there are some who've decided that we're going to abort this. They think we're just going forward as planned. And then these forces that think that they're just going to go forward, they've dispersed. They're hungry, so they're looking for food. Some of them decided, I'm going to go to sleep, so they're sleeping in ditches and outbuildings. And this is when the British forces decide it's time to engage. Now, while I said that these two militaries were pretty well matched when it came to numbers, keep in mind the British still do have a thousand more men. And if you're going to go to -to hand-to-hand battle, having a thousand more men is better, obviously. Not to mention that you already have a third of the forces gone somewhere else. They're like, "Uh, we're not playing anymore. And then some of the other guys who are still there are sleeping or off doing something else. They're not ready for a battle. On top of this, you've got the British who are more skilled with artillery. And they have these weapons that work in a fashion that's almost like a machine gun. We're getting very close to having that kind of technology at this time. You've got a highland terrain that is very difficult to traverse. And that makes charging hard. Plus, rain and sleet happen to be falling from the sky at the same time. The conditions are just horrible for any kind of battle, much less if you're not fully prepared for what's about to happen here. This is going to be a very brief skirmish, and it's going to start around 11 o'clock, and it's only going to last for about an hour. The Jacobites formed three columns with the three MacDonald battalions, a small one of Chris Holmes, and another small one of McLean's and McLaughlin's. Lady McIntosh and Mollentree's regiments were also here, as well as Lord Lavat's regiment, Ardshiel's Op and Stewart's, Lochiel's regiment, and three battalions of the Athol Brigade. So these different, and they're basically clans, have all formed three columns. Bonnie Prince Charlie, he's supposed to be leading the charge here, right? Well, he takes off and he goes and hides somewhere. (laughs) This guy is pretty much useless, really, when you think about it. He gets all these people drummed up to, hey, let's get my dad back on the throne. And then when it comes down to, we need your leadership, he takes off. So somebody goes and finds him and says, Dude, we need you to order the charge. Come on. So he comes out and he orders that they should charge. The first clan that's going to conduct the charge is the clan Chadden. So they rush forward across this field. But again, the terrain is not real good that they're trying to go across. And instead of being able to go straight across, they're having to go off to the side. So this is going to put them at a disadvantage already because it's kind of I don't even know how really to describe it, but the way it sounded like to me is it's almost like there's a wall there. I don't know if it was a wall of stone, if it's just a ridge or something. 
but it's going to be something that kind of blocks them and pins them in. It's, you don't want to be up against this, but they're heading that way because they can't go up the central way. So you've got the Jacobites advancing on the left flank of the government troops because they're coming around this way. But what they're facing is superior firepower, and there's these volleys of musket fire that first have round shot, and then it switches to grape shot, and this is raining down on them. They manage to charge all the way to the government lines, and we have this direct clash ensuing. And again, I'm envisioning the battles from Braveheart. I'm sure for those of you who've watched Outlander, they probably show the battles there too, so that's probably what you're envisioning, which would be even more accurate because it's actually at this location. Two British regiments took the brunt of this direct clash that we have going on, but it was minimal, and they decided to follow through with a counterattack. This counterattack was formed with five battalions, and they formed this horseshoe-shaped formation, and what this did is it caused the Jacobites to be trapped. It's almost like they encircled them, only they only had the back end for retreat right now. While they're being surrounded with this horseshoe shape, the left wing is collapsing, and it's a catastrophic collapse. The Jacobites realize, okay, we're trapped. We've lost our left wing. The only thing we can do is retreat, and that's what they start doing. They start retreating. Now, there's another clan group that's waiting in the wings, kind of like an ambush, but their leader was killed, and so they soon were in retreat, too, because they had no leadership. There was a group of Irish piquettes, and they came to the rescue, and it was a good thing they did because basically they prevented a massacre from happening here. They made it so that these men were able to get away, and a lot of the casualties that the British took were from these Irish guys that came in to the rescue. Prince Charlie was not ready to give up. Even though he'd taken off and was hiding before he called for the charge, he's like, no, wait, we don't want to quit yet. We're not going to retreat yet. One of his captains was named Shay, and he comes up to Charlie's bodyguard and he says, you see all of this is going to pot. You can be of no great succour. So before a general de Root, which will soon be, seize upon the prince and take him off, which basically I think means go tell the prince we're running and he's got to come with us. We're not fighting anymore. So the bodyguard goes to Charlie and tells him this is what they're saying. The lowland regiments retreated southwards and the Highlanders went back towards Ruthven Barracks. The government cavalry cut them down and the rest of them had to retreat to Inverness. They were pursued and it was said given no quarter, which basically means they were chased down and butchered. So even if they were saying, you know, we, we surrender, we surrender, they were dead. However, the government troops that were running after these guys decided to spare 50 French officers and soldiers. I'm assuming it's because they were French. I don't know. The government forces went on to capture 14 of the colors or standards that were on the field that day. The Jacobites had suffered a crushing defeat that left 2,000 of their number dead or wounded. The British suffered only 300 casualties. Very lopsided. There would be one more small skirmish that was naval, and this Jacobite uprising was over. This solidified the fact that the House of Stuart would not return, and Bonnie Prince Charlie never tried to challenge the crown again. He took off, I think he spent some time in France, and then he managed to make his way to Rome, and that's where he died. The Jacobites were basically done and over, disbanded. They would never make another push either. The punishment that the Duke of Cumberland issued after the battle left him with the nickname The Butcher. There was no forgiveness for these rebels. They hunted these men down and just slaughtered them. And there's been some controversy around the Duke of Cumberland that even comes into our era. The University of Glasgow awarded the Duke of Cumberland an honorary doctorate. And there were a lot of people who complained, especially historians who said, now, wait a minute, maybe we shouldn't honor this guy because, yeah, this guy might have won this battle in Culloden and pushed back against the Jacobites and kept the crown the way it was supposed to be or whatever. But look at what he did afterward. I mean, if you're calling somebody a butcher, maybe you don't want to give him an honorary doctorate. There were further civil penalties that were put down on the Scots. And this, basically, these civil penalties that were out there, 
eradicated the Gaelic culture and undermined the Scottish clan system. And as I said earlier, it was made illegal to play bagpipes. I love bagpipes. I can't imagine anything more horrible than saying no more bagpipes. But because they were considered a part of the Scottish culture and the Gaelic culture, they were out, as well as the tartans. We all know that uh, each clan has its own colors. They didn't want them to be able to identify in that way. So you're not allowed to wear that anymore. Today, people come from all over the world to see the Culloden Battlefield. The visitor center is located near the site of the battle, and it was opened in December of 2007. This field had been a grazing ground during the battle, but today it's covered in heather and shrubs. There are footpaths to explore and a memorial that stands 20 feet high made of stones. This was erected by Duncan Forbes in 1881. It was also in that same year that Forbes erected headstones to mark the mass graves of the clans. Most of these men were just buried pretty much where they died in these mass graves. The English stone marks the place of the government dead, and this is near the old Lanark Cottage. I'm sure I said that wrong. I tried to find a way to say it online, and I couldn't find anything. However, I did find a video that featured the cottage, and it's It's very neat looking. It's made of stone, obviously, and it has a grass thatch type roof. Something that might surprise some people is that this was not an English versus Scots thing. And you probably were getting that kind of feel when I was telling you that on this side, you had the French and the Irish also helping out. They were expecting some English Jacobites to come over and help. So you probably were getting a feel that we had a little bit of a mix going on here. Well, it wasn't just on the Jacobite side. It was also on the English side, too. More Scots fought for the Duke of Cumberland than for Prince Charlie, if you can believe that. There were a lot of Scots who supported the House of Hanover being in charge of the crown. They did not want the Stuart House back in. I was kind of shocked to find that out in my research, that there were more Scots on the British side. And in fact, Scottish Captain Ferguson chased down and hanged Highland rebels as he scoured the Scottish Isles. So he went after his own countrymen, basically, who were rebels and ruthlessly hanged all of them. Because so many of them were on the run, many Jacobites ended up fleeing to the American colonies. They came over here. And there is a strong Jacobite influence in American history when you look back on it. A lot of them decided to come here because their way of life was gone anyway. The only building to survive the battle that still stands today is the old Lanark Cottage. And it was inhabited until 1912, and it's now kept by the National Trust for Scotland. And they have it refurbished to look much like it did in the 18th century. Now, there were barns that were around the cottage that are no longer there. This is because the government redcoats found 30 wounded Jacobites seeking refuge within them. And so they barricaded the barns and burned the Jacobites alive. So after hearing about this battle and hearing about how so many of these Jacobites were ruthlessly hunted down and killed and slaughtered, I guess we can all imagine the battlefield is full of negative energy. Supernatural activity here is said to be high, and the legends and lore that date back to even before the battle reveal even more strange activity that had nothing to do with the aftermath of the battle. While I'm saying we had a lot of negative stuff going on with the battle, so maybe that's why it's led to some paranormal activity, we had activity going on before we even had any of this negative stuff going on. So where did that come from and why? We're going to look at some of that stuff because it's weird and kind of creepy. On the edge of Inverness and on part of the battlefield stands Culloden Woods. It is within these woods that one can find St. Mary's Well. Although the name leads one to think that this is probably some kind of Christian thing, a Christian connection, it actually has its roots in pagan traditions and was originally called Tabar in Oing. And I know I slaughtered that, which meant well of youth in Gaelic. The well is named for St. Mary who lived in the woods. She would do her rounds with a bucket in her hand. 
And it was said that she healed the sick with water from her well. So what she would do is dip her bucket down into this well. She would take the water to the people who were sick and have them drink it, and they would be healed. This well has a legendary claim of being a place of healing. So people are encouraged to come to the well, and they carry on a tradition in which they make a wish or ask to be healed or say whatever they need healing from. They walk around the well three times. They gather water in a cupped hand and drink deeply. And then they tie a scrap of cloth, usually from their own clothing. They tie this tightly around a nearby tree. This ritual is said to only work when done on Beltane. It is more than just tourists and villagers who come. It's said that the clansmen come too. You're probably going, wait a minute, how do the clansmen come? There are no clans anymore. I mean, the clan way of life is gone. The fact that they come on Beltane or they're supposed to come on Beltane means that they're coming two weeks too late for them. So if you're thinking the Klansmen, it's two weeks too late if they come on Beltane. Oh, wait a minute. These guys aren't alive, are they? These are apparitions. They've been seen so many times that few are skeptical about the stories. There's literally that many times that they've been seen by somebody that these spirits of these clan members who died during the battle come to the well. I don't know if they're coming to seek some kind of healing or if this is residual. Not sure, but they're seen coming to the well. The fact that they're doing it according to when people are told that they should do it, which is on Beltane, that's just weird. I mean, (laughs) I don't know. How do they know that they're supposed to come on Beltane? And if this is something residual, why are they coming on that date? The clansmen were said to have experienced an omen before the Battle of Culloden. Many were gathered near a well on the road from Oog to Portree. They were all stunned when a blood-soaked man ran up to them with pure terror in his eyes. He called out, Defeat! He yelled it twice more, Defeat! Defeat! And this was said with anguish, and then he vanished before their eyes. The group all looked at each other, realizing that they had witnessed a phantom. They then heard distant drums and a clash of swords. The sound moved quickly upon them, and it was as if a ghostly army in battle passed right through their midst. The group had no way of knowing that this was an omen of the demise that was to come the next day at the Battle of Culloden. Somebody that was in this group survived the battle and must have told this story that has been passed down through the generations telling people that basically there was something telling them that they were going to be defeated. And you again have to ask, is this somehow a materialized premonition showing them this? Is this some kind of harbinger of doom that they were seeing? What was this? You also have to wonder, as I was telling you, we have all these splits that are going on within the Jacobites. They are not feeling confident, and a lot of them are just wanting to go home and retreat. It makes you wonder how many had seen this scene and whether it's from superstition or something else, they just got to thinking, you know, I don't want to do this because I don't think things are going to go well based on what we just saw. I have to imagine that this blood soaked man must have been wearing the colors of one of the clans as well, that they would be like thinking that this would be a Scotsman. Have you ever heard of the scree? I myself had not. And if you Google Scree, because when I heard the name, I'm like, well, let me Google Scree and see what kind of folklore we have about this. All I could find was information that referenced rock debris. But it would seem that Scottish clans believed in a figure that they called the Scree or the Great Scree. And they said that it was bad luck to see it. Death was said to surely follow. The Scree is described as a large black bird that rises up from the heather, screeching or screaming. The day of the battle, the men leading the Scots all claimed to see the scree. George Murray, when he saw it, was frozen to his spot. The bird practically blocked out the evening sky. It flew over Dramasi Moor, giving off a shrieking caw, and then it just disappeared mid-flight. This was another bad omen. And it was not just something for the people of that time to see. A tourist witnessed it on the battlefield in July of 2005. What makes this legendary bird odd here is that it makes noise. As I described it, it has this shrieking caw that it gives off. The reason why that's odd is because it is said that no bird makes any noise at the battlefield. They nest in the heather and the trees. They fly over the moor and the graves. They make no noise. 
I'd be interested to know from any of you out there listening who have visited the battlefield, did you notice that no birds made any noise there? Or is that just a story, a legend? Because I would find that fascinating, that birds would be quiet, because birds usually are pretty loud. The ghost of the Highlander is said to wander here. A woman from Edinburgh was visiting in August of 1936. She was reading some of the clan stones and noticed that someone had laid a tartan on the cairn. She lifted the cloth so she could read the name and a ghostly face peered back at her. He stared at her. She ran. I don't blame her. I would have too. Other people who've seen this apparition claim that he seems shell-shocked and lost. He walks for a while and then just stops. When people try to approach him, he disappears. It seems that most stories about him have him being spotted on April 16th. So it's almost like he comes back on the anniversary. And I don't know that this apparition that this woman saw and the Highlander are one and the same, but it's possible that they are as well. Temperature fluctuations happen rapidly near the Cairns. On the anniversary of the battle, locals claim that they hear the battle as though it's being reenacted. There are the sounds of drummers beating a tattoo, weapons clashing, and men yelling. And then the sounds just stop. Andrea Byrne of Scottish Paranormal took a team of investigators onto Dramasi Moor, and they used dousing rods to try to find energy lines and they found one running from Cumberland Stone to St. Mary's Well. Temperature and humidity fluctuations were dramatic near the graves. They conducted interviews with staff who claimed to hear disembodied sounds, and they reported that visitors often claim to hear the sounds of battle. Most psychics who visit claim that the activity is all residual, just replaying events. Even if none of this activity is intelligent, it still seems to exist. It's a reminder replaying over and over of the horrible thing that happened here when men fought and killed each other over a power struggle. Many lost their physical lives, but what was really lost was a culture. Highlanders bogged down in mud and overwhelmed by more powerful artillery could have no idea that their way of life was dying with them. Perhaps the energy that replays here over and over is a desperate attempt for this culture's spirit to live again somehow. Is the Culloden Battlefield haunted? That is for you to decide. Well, I definitely want to get myself on over to those areas, just another place to visit in Scotland. And I know that uh, Susie Doomy had mentioned that she'd been over there and that it was a very moving experience to be on that battlefield. And I know several of the listeners are of families that actually fought at this battle. So that's very cool. want to encourage you guys to check out the website at historygoesbump.com. And if you would like to send me some feedback, you can do that at historygoesbump at gmail.com. Michael left a comment on the website. He said, hi, I love your podcast. I had the chance to go check out the Central State Hospital Asylum in Georgia this past summer. I just toured the outside grounds, but there are thousands buried throughout in unmarked graves. And he asked that I see if I can do a future episode on that, which I definitely will add it to the list. Thank you for suggesting that. And it seems that's the case with almost all of the asylums out there is that all of these people were just buried in all these unmarked graves. And many of them, if they were quote unquote lucky, at least had a number to go with their burial. I have a new podcast I think you guys might be interested in checking out. It's called Caskets and Cocktails. It's a daughter and father who talk about various things that have happened in cemeteries because her dad used to run a few cemeteries. So I've been having a lot of fun listening to it. I want to thank all of you who are executive producers for getting your mailing addresses updated or sending them to me. If you have not done that, please do so. I will be sending out Christmas cards with gifts for everybody who's giving at all levels. Just one of the perks of being an executive producer of the History Ghost Bump podcast during the month of December. And a little way for me to say thank you for your support. It's greatly appreciated. Could not do the show without you guys. I have a review from Stitcher to share with everybody. This is from Shannon Wolf. Five stars. So much fun to listen to. If you want dry, boring history and no spooky things, this is not the podcast for you. If you like hosts that are interactive and engaging, this is. There's also an amazing Facebook community, The Spooktacular Crew. I've been binging the episodes for about a month. They got me hooked on Victoria's Lift, which led me to the Wicked Library, so there have been breaks. Thank you, ladies, for an amazing experience. Well, thank you, Shannon, for listening. We appreciate that. And thanks for leaving a review over at Stitcher. I don't have very many of them over there, so I appreciate that. Also, I've been getting a lot of five-star reviews over at Apple Podcasts without actual comments. I appreciate those, too. You don't have to write a thing. Just 
mark some stars, and it's all good to me. I want to thank you all for listening to this episode. I've been your host, Diane. You take care now. Bye-bye. This episode has been brought to you by our executive producers. Dispatches from the Grave Digger. We don't have anybody new to welcome into the cemetery, but we do have a couple that have raised their support levels. First, I want to thank Anna Kraus for raising your support. We will be moving you into a chest tomb. And Nikki Freeze, we're going to be moving you into a garden crypt. Thanks, ladies. And now we have some more eulogies by Mort. And I'm glad everybody's really enjoying these. I know Mort's been having a great time coming up with them for you guys. Eulogies by Mort. Lee Gibson had lived in Kentucky. Having her here makes me feel lucky. For over two years she had been a supporter. Now I need to fill this vault with mortar. Liz Evans hailed from the United Kingdom. I bet now she has afterlife wisdom. For three years she supported HGB. I wonder if her ghost would like some tea. Michelle B. Priest joined us at the Biltmore in Nashville. Haunted places really gave her a thrill. She had supported us several years. Unfortunately, now she'll have worms in her ears. April Garachi shared with us Filipino folklore. I think we need her back for an encore. She had lived near San Francisco Bay, but now she's down here in the clay. Katie Bigelow shared with us Gettysburg College. Apparently ghosts like institutes of higher knowledge. She was a longtime supporter. We're really going to miss her. Cindy Fellows was a very good writer. She's lucky these blowflies can't bite her. She had lived in the Golden State. I hope she thinks this eulogy is great. Bob Flood listened to old time radio. His body will help this tree grow. He drank coffee by a guy named Tim Horton. I think possibly his life it did shorten. Check out the website at historygoesbump.com.